There we are. We're live. Uh, Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to be discussing with you tonight the question, have you committed the unpardonable sin? What is the unpardonable sin based on the Bible? All right. Now, I cannot imagine anything more horrible than having to spend eternity in hell apart from God. Yet, Jesus says that there is a particular sin that, that it is, if you commit it, you are doomed for eternity in a place called hell. Let's begin to look in Matthew chapter 12, if you will, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, now watch this, all manner of sin and blasphemy. Hi, Catherine and James, glad to have you on here. Um, Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But, now watch carefully, Victoria it says, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Alright? But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, or neither in the world to come. Alright? So, you know, Jesus says that there is a particular sin that a person can commit and be doomed for eternity in a place called hell. This is a sin for which there is absolutely uh, uh, no forgiveness. Alright? And, and that's a kind of a sobering thought, isn't it? So, this sin has, has come to known as the unpardonable sin, even though the word unpardonable sin is not recorded in the Bible. When someone is deemed unpardonable, it simply means that there is no forgiveness possible forever. And if Jesus really says that, there's, that it's possible to commit the sin, uh, uh, the sin that is so hideous, so horrible, so awful, and also so repulsive to God, that, uh, that He, the very uh, uh, God of grace, cannot and will not forgive you for this sin. So, what is it? Alright? Uh, in fact, there are many uh, who, who, in this room, that you may be at the point of committing that sin. Those on Facebook, watching us live, or on YouTube, they may be ready, fixing to commit that sin. So, what is that sin? Well, I, I want to talk to you about the unpardonable sin, the danger or possibility. Uh, would, wouldn't you want to know ahead of time that you that you were on the edge of having a sin that could not be forgiven in this life or the life to come? First of all, we ask you, have you committed the unpardonable sin? Let's look at this, all right? From the Word of God. So the fear, number one, point number one, the fear surrounding this sin. The word unpardonable sin does not appear in the Bible. Men who fear committing this sin uh, 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 gives them a sense of urgency, right? The very name points out man's fear of this sin. The unpardonable sin. There's also a theological uh, uh, designation for a sin that can never have forgiveness. The preacher, I thought Jesus died for all sin. He did. He did. But there is one sin that a person can commit that is unforgivable by God. And he says, I have often heard of people refer to the commission of this sin. Many who came to, uh, to be saved uh, have feared that they were guilty of committing this sin. And so usually the fear of committing the sin uh, is grounded in falsehood, grounded in poor interpretation, grounded outside of the Scriptures, just flat out in ignorance, all right? Some people think that uh, divorce is the unpardonable sin. They think that murder is. Uh, uh, but usually my aim to, is to shed some light on the, this very thing so people understand what the Bible says about this subject. So the fear surrounding the sin. Number two, the falsehoods surrounding the sin. Many have uh, 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 varied in the ideas as to what this sin may be. 99.9%, .9%, however, are, are absolutely plainly wrong. So let me share some thoughts with you. Uh, notice uh, some things that men have classified as the unpardonable sin. Uh, some may think that it's murder. Uh, but, but what about David? 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Uh, chapter 11 and 12. 
Uh, God forgave him. Go back and read Acts 13, 22. Why, why, he committed murder, and yet God forgave him. How about suicide? That's always a, a hot topic. This is the sin of self-murder. And, and while it cannot be repented of, it's still re- covered in, the, uh, in the, what's called the anointing of, of, of the blood of Jesus Christ in Matthew 12, 31. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. Some people think that the unpardonable sin was murder, suicide. Some think it was even adultery, like David. Uh, by the way, ever, you ever, have you ever lusted in your heart? As growing up, and you see, in Matthew five twenty eight, you might say, "Well, I committed sin in my life. I've committed adultery." Jesus said, "If you think about it and, and everything, and you let that conceive in you, then you, you, you're just as guilty as if you'd done it, right?" So adultery, or are you? So you ask yourself, "Am I really saved?" Uh, how about lying? Abraham, Genesis chapter twelve, verse ten through twenty. How about Genesis 18, 17 through 19? How about Simon Peter in Matthew 26, verse 69 through 75, and Acts 2, 14 through 41? So these, these are people that have sinned. David uh, uh, committed murder, uh, uh, adultery. David committed adultery. Abraham, he committed lying over and over and over. He's supposed to be the father uh, of all nations, right? How about in Ephesians 4, 28? How about stealing? How about taking God's name in vain? Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. How about uh, uh, Peter? Uh, 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 or we should say Second Peter. How about Matthew 26, 74? The Bible has a lot to say about this. So what about failing as a Christian? Second Peter 2, 21. Did you know the disciples failed in Matthew chapter 27, verse 56? They all forsook Him and they fled when He went to Calvary. And, and yet... Uh, uh, they, they, yet here Jesus is on the cross of Calvary and they've turned their back on Jesus. They've backslid. They've walked away. So is that the unpardonable sin? No. They all forsook Him. They all fled. And nor is it any of the sins that you could name that I didn't name here today. Uh, nor is it any of the sins that... You see, Jesus died, the Bible says, uh, for them all. In John 1, 29. In Colossians chapter 2, Verse 13 through 14. How about Hebrew 9, 26? Uh, you'll find here that Jesus died for every sin that you and I could ever commit on the face of this earth. The truth is the death of Jesus on the cross paid for all sin and He paid for it forever. And in fact, we can find that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, Victoria. How about Psalms 103, verse 12? You see, uh, you have to understand the glory of being forgiven. What a thought that is, right? But however, there remains one sin that there is no forgiveness for now or forever. So we looked at, number one, the fear surrounding the sin. Number two, the falsehood surrounding the sin. And number three, the facts surrounding the sin. Who can commit the unpardonable sin? Can a, can a, a, a child of God that's been saved commit it? The answer is no. Here's the reason why. We are saved, Romans 5, verse 9, 2 Timothy 1, 9. If we, are, if we were to totally blow it as a child of God, as a Christian in our life, and we wind up in the gutter of life, even that does not, uh, 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 you have to understand, that's not what's based your salvation on. Your salvation is based on the blood of Jesus Christ, on the grace of God, the mercy of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Not everyone, though, gets it right. The guy in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, apparently, even he was saved. And, and yet, think, think on this a little while. Everyone in the Bible that you read have made a mistake. They failed as a Christian. Well, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 30, Luffy, that we are sealed. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The saint may grieve the Spirit. But when He came in, He came in to stay. You can't get rid of the Holy Spirit once He's inside of you. In fact, John 14, 16 through 18 talks about that. 2 Timothy 2, 13 talks about that. But we are sealed and we are secure. 1 Peter 1, 5. Why? The saint of God is as certain of heaven and everything uh, as if we're already there. Paul said, you know, to, to die is gain. He said, I'm already there. 
So think about this. D.L. Moody was a great preacher. And he told the story of an old aged minister who believed he had committed the unpardonable sin. And after much inner turmoil, we find that he gave in to what is mistakenly his thoughts uh, to be God's will. He said, well, it's God's will, I guess, for me to be lost. And if you read the Bible, there's something wrong with what he just said. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Support, and, he, and he said this question, suppose there is a hell for you. What would you, with your disposition, do there? And he asked him that. D.L. Moody asked him that. And he was very quick to answer. Well, I would set up a prayer meeting. Uh, and, and with those words came the light of God to show the, the absurdity of his fears. Listen, you say, why would you set up a prayer meeting? So they wouldn't come to this place. So the very fact that he feared that he had committed the sin, plus his deep concern, proved he had not. Because if you've committed the unpardonable sin, there's no conviction in your heart. There's no conviction in your mind. So can a sinner commit it? The answer is yes, because he is outside of the protect, protective shield of the blood of Jesus Christ. Anyone who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ can possibly be guilty of this sin. And we have seen that this sin is not uh, who can and who cannot commit it. But, but I want you to understand, uh, how can you know if you're guilty or if you've been guilty of committing the unpardonable sin? So what is the unpardonable sin? Well, turn to John 16. You see, they were rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit concerning Christ. The Pharisees were uh, uh, attributing the work of the Holy Spirit in Christ to the devil. They were rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit concerning Christ. So the Holy Spirit is in the business of showing off Jesus. John 16, verse 13 through 14. Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. And for He shall not speak of Himself, but whosoever He shall hear that shall speak, and He will show you the things to come. So Jesus, by His miracles, had proven uh, uh, Himself to be God. And when the Pharisees rejected the witness of the Spirit, their rejecting God was complete and final. So Israel and their rejection of the Almighty. In John 1, 11, Brian, it says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. So what is the unpardonable sin? In rejecting John the Baptist, they were rejecting the Father. In rejecting the person of Christ, they were rejecting the Son. In, in rejecting the Apostles, they were rejecting the Spirit. So to, to reject the forerunner, which was John the Baptist, is forgivable. To reject the pre-Calvary of Jesus was forgivable. But to reject the witness of the Holy Spirit was the final straw. And it meant absolute destruction and eternal damnation. So some say, well, Christ is no longer on the earth. And these events cannot be duplicated. Therefore, the sin cannot be committed. That's wrong. You know, this is correct, but, but only to a point. The Bible's clear. Ultimately, their sin boiled down to simply rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit concerning the truth of Jesus Christ and His identity. Can this sin be committed today? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit still testifies of Jesus. In fact, without the drawing of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says no man can be saved. So the Holy Spirit still testifies that, declaring Him to be in all Scripture. Look with me, if you will, in John 15, 26. For, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, He shall testify of Me. Alright? So the Holy Spirit still convicts of sin. In John 16, 7-10. John 6, 44. The whole purpose of the Holy Spirit, Lupi, is to convict a person that they understand that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. That Jesus is that Savior. John three thirty six. 36. Uh, watch carefully. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. So we find that no other sin uh, can send you to hell except this one. Everyone else, every other sin has been paid for. Well, preacher, what, what if somebody committed suicide? It was paid for. If somebody committed murder, it was paid for. You see, if somebody committed adultery, it was paid for. There is no sin that God, when He's on the cross, His blood cannot cleanse. But if you reach that point 
to where you're going to take your last breath of air on this earth. And you've rejected the witness of the Holy Spirit. And you said no, because every one of us here have gone to church earlier in our life. We heard the gospel, we rejected it. We heard the gospel, we rejected it. Less, less glad to have you. Hope you, your, your bride is wonderful. Uh, so, uh, have you committed the unpardonable sin? Well, we're learning very quickly that what it is, is the rejection of the Spirit of God. So in the Spirit of God, if you've ever been to a church service, you feel like, man, I need to go down on my knees. I need to ask God to save. But you held off. In fact, you gripped the pew to your knuckles turned white. And you said, no, no, no. And the next time you went, you said, no, no, no. And the next time you went, you said, no, no, no. But somewhere in those no's, you said a yes. You see, but once you draw on your last breath, and once you breathe that last breath out, I've watched a lot of people die. I've held a lot of hands out of these 35, 36 years of ministry. And it's amazing how quickly their body grows cold. It's amazing how they, when they take that last breath, the gurgling sounds in the lungs. I'm not trying to be that graphic, but I'm telling you, when, when that happens, there's no chance of them taking another breath and saying, Hey, I want to be saved. You see, if the Holy Spirit of God has dealt with you, the time is to get saved right now. But you can reject the revelation uh, of the Holy Spirit for a while and let her come to know Jesus as long as you're alive. You see, the Scripture tells us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the Savior. He's the Creator. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, what, believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Yet you can reject for a time, and later come to know Jesus Christ as your eternal Savior. If the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart, listen, don't say no, because that might be the final no. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm not going to mess with you ever again. I'm, only, I'm never going to touch your heart. I'm not going to make you feel like you need God. And you know, except the Holy Spirit draws them, no man shall be saved. So you can deny all the evidence around you and refuse to believe and still, still not commit the unpardonable sin. Yet when the Holy Spirit of God deals with your heart and you see for yourself the claims of the Scripture that yes, Jesus is the Savior. He is God's Son. He is our Messiah. He's the only hope that we have. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. So when the Spirit shows you that Jesus really is God, and the only hope for sinners to be saved, uh, that He really died for you, and, and He died for all of your sins. When you say no to the Spirit of God, then you have crossed that line. Now you come to church and you don't feel the urge to get saved. In fact, you don't feel the urge to even go to church. You don't feel the urge to read your Bible anymore. And yet you, you've hardened your heart. Yet you can reject for a time. But, but once the Holy Spirit has dealt with your heart for the last time. You remember how Pharaoh, God hardened his heart? You know what he means by that? He no longer tried to take and change his heart. The Holy Spirit no longer tried to help Pharaoh to understand uh, uh, what the way of salvation was. So uh, the, people ask, am I guilty of committing the horrible sin? That is not to say that God will not give you one chance or two chances or, or ten chances or a dozen chances. But it doesn't mean that He will give you another chance. This could be the last time the Holy Spirit deals with your heart. This, what if this was it? You say, well, yeah, but after that, I, every now and then I'd go to church. But it didn't feel, like I, didn't feel like I was getting anything out of it. Well, listen, the only reason why you're not getting anything out of it is because you're not connected to God through the Spirit of God and through the Word of God. So listen to this. Saying no to the pleading of the Holy Spirit, it's a serious thing. Eventually, it will lead you to a place called hell. And unless, and unless a sinner says yes to the Holy Spirit and receives Christ as their Savior, then yes, they will die and they will go out into eternity and be judged by God forever. In our, in our uh, message tonight, in verse 32, this verse uh, plain, uh, plainly says that to reject Jesus is to condemn oneself to eternity apart from God. So somewhere there's a deadline placed by the Lord uh, that, that no man can be saved. 
Luke, you can go to church and go to church and go to church, but going to church isn't going to save you. You can carry four or five Bibles, it's not going to save you. You can, you can put on some Bermuda shorts and go out and hand out gospel tracts. That's not going to save you. So listen, and the Bible is very clear. Except you understand who Jesus is. Do you understand? He's not just some name in our Bible. He's not just some name in a storybook. He's God. He's the creator of all things. He's the one who, when He was on Calvary, He shed His blood and paid for your sins. Paid for mine. So please, uh, 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 do not go on with your sins until you cross the dead line. Don't cross the dead line. You see, the day of your death, Ecclesiastes 11.3, uh, that which is done in death cannot be undone in eternity. Listen, you say, well, I'll put it off. I, I don't like going to church. I don't like being convicted. I don't, think, I don't want to change my life. I'm happy with the way it is. But the day of your death, the day of your death, the day you draw your last breath and you breathe that last breath out and you go out into eternity, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you will not be entering into the holy gates of God. All right, Bible's very clear. Well, what about the rapture of the church in Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse eleven to thirteen? You say, you say, what does that mean? If you say no to Jesus, you'll be left behind. The Bible's very clear. In fact, in the book of Matthew chapter seven, it says that the the gate is wide, but the way is narrow, and few f e w that will find it. That is the most curious verse to me in the Bible. Uh, sending your way, uh, 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 your, your day of grace, Genesis 6.13. The Bible says, quench not the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the Spirit. All right, the, the day may come when the sweet Holy Spirit of God will never again touch your heart. Never tug at you, never get you to say, well, you know, I'm a sinner and I need to get saved. Or I'm saved, but I need to get right with God I need to change my life. See, He ceases to draw. He ceases, and you cannot come to Jesus. John 6, 44. Except the Holy Spirit of God draw you, no man shall be saved. See, He is knocking. He's knocking. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Quench not the Spirit. Revelation 3, 20. Behold, I stand at the door. And not, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. See, he's ready and willing at any moment to save everyone. So it is your lifestyle, question mark. Is it your pride, question mark. Is it the friends and families, question mark. Uh, is it your sin? Is it worth going to hell over? Please do not throw away the most valuable thing that you have. For You say in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 through 37. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Listen, don't, don't wait till the last moment. You don't know when that's going to be. I, I saw a picture on Facebook. It was horrible. There was a bus. There was a car and another vehicle. It looked like a, uh, a, a Jeep. And the Jeep had gone back in and hit the back of that vehicle. And it went right under that bus. And the top of that vehicle was just completely you know, decapitated. And I was shocked to find out the person survived. If there had been a passenger there, they would not. But the driver survived. How lucky they were. Why? God's given them a second chance. You see? So is it your lifestyle that's keeping you from getting saved? Is it your pride? Uh, is it your choice of sexuality? I'll bring that out. Uh, is, is it your the friends or the people you're running with? And, and it, is that sin? Is it worth it? Is it worth dying going to hell over? It's not. So once that sin has been committed, a line has forever been crossed. And some here today may be about to cross that line. Why, I know there's a lot of people that they used to come to church, they felt the tug of the Holy Spirit, and they would get on the altars and they would cry some tears. You know, they never made a commitment of salvation. And today, they're not even in church today. Why? The Holy Spirit doesn't deal with the heart anymore. I don't want to be in that place. Why? Because once that sin is committed, a line has been drawn by God. And there's no way. In fact, God will allow your heart to become hardened. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will never deal with your heart ever again. So how do we close this out? It's simple. You want to ask yourself, have I or someone I know might have committed the unpardonable sin? Uh, not if you're saved. Because once you're saved, uh, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, right? And so not even if you're lost. 
and still concerned about your soul. As long as you're concerned about eternity and where you might spend it. Hey, you, you, you haven't committed it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's kind of dropping a few crumbs. We talk about the crumbs of Jesus today. And so every, every track that's been given to you, every invitation, every sermon you've ever heard, every invitation that was given, I'm, I'm, we're giving an invitation today. The Bible's in the book of Revelation, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. It's an open invitation for you to make a decision for Jesus Christ. But I remind you, my dear friend, that this day may well be your last opportunity to come to Jesus. Is He calling you? Question mark. Ask yourself that. Is He tugging at your heart today to get some things straightened out in your life? You see, if He is, please do not send Him away. Please don't turn your, your, your heart from Him. Allow the Holy Spirit to do the job that He came to do. And that was to guide us in all manner of truth. Listen, it all begins with a simple, small step of faith. Like the thief on the cross. It, will, will you make that step today? Uh, he'll not turn you away. In fact, John 6.37 reminds us of that. Uh, Luby, you know, one thing that really bothers me is I, I, I run into a lot of people. And I know a lot of people. And, uh, uh, but I'm always concerned, did that person know Christ? So I, I made a decision that before I leave that person, and once I meet them, and I let them know that, hey, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you mind if I ask you, have you ever trusted Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior? I just bring it out. I bring it out. Why? Because of the essence. You don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. There's a lot of people that are going to fill the church pews that will die and go to hell. There's a lot of preachers that preach the Word of God will die and go to hell. A lot of deacons that, that, that formalize the church will die and go to hell. There's some good Sunday school teachers that will die and go to hell. Why? They got involved in church, but they never got involved with the Savior. It's a small step. So my question to you, have you truly accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And if you have, listen, I want to encourage you to make a commitment. You see, what, what do we do? The Bible is very clear in the Great Commission in the book of Matthew, the last part of Matthew, that we're to go out and teach everyone about the, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, once they get saved, we're to help them to identify with that decision. We do it through baptism and church attendance. And, and that means not just to attend church every now and then, but come to church because we don't want to, uh, to, to lower what this church is. This is the house of God. This is a place of worship. It's, it's just a building without it. You see, and, and this building can't worship God. You see, the, those pews, I don't know about you, but I don't hear any amens coming out of those. They're empty, right? So what are you saying? I'm saying, listen, we are the very reason why Christ went to Calvary. He died so you and I could have salvation. And so that the Holy Spirit of God can be given to you to lead you, to guide you in all manner of life. You say, well, I, I never feel the Holy Spirit tugging. Then if you're saved, I, I encourage you to come and tell God, hey, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, begin to convict my heart. Now listen, if you're not saved, I would suggest you come and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and, I, and I, I'm doomed for hell. And I'm asking you, please, by your shed blood, that you would come into my heart and save me once and for all. Save me, Lord Jesus. That's what the thief on the cross did. If you were part of our service this morning, it's a little bit shocking service we had, but it talked about a woman, that, and Jesus ignored her. Jesus didn't listen to her. And everything else, Why? Because he wanted her to think about it and think about it. And the more she thought about it, and, he, and she talked, she brought up worship. And yet the worship she was involved in was a very occultic worship, a sexual type of worship. And it was abomination, right? And so it, it's not that type of worship. He, he talked about trusting him as, his, as their Savior. And then worshiping Jesus as their Savior. All right? So what an ironic thing that a woman begging for her daughter to have a devil rebuked out of her and Jesus ignored her. Why? Because there was too much at stake. You see, it wasn't about removing a demon. It's about going back in and removing the sin debt of a woman so that she could be saved and go home and, and talk to her daughter. In fact, Jesus 
committed the fact that her daughter, the demon, was gone when she got there. And yet she talked to her daughter and told her why the demon is gone. They talked to the family. They talked to the family and the friends. And so why? Through one woman who got saved, but Jesus would not talk to her about a miracle until she was willing to take and look at the miracle worker, Jesus himself. When she got saved, that was base one. Then, of course, he sent her to base two. And eventually we all reached home base. Home base is the day that, that, of Victoria that we draw our last breath. And we go out to eternity. Let me ask all of you, just right here. If you died today, think about it. You laid your head down, you closed your eyes, and you died tonight. Are you 100% for sure that you're saved? If not, then I encourage you to pray this prayer with me right now. It's not the prayer. But the prayer is just simply acknowledging to Jesus that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And He'll save you. Let's pray that prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner because of Adam and Eve. And because of the things I see in my own life. The things that come up in my mind. Lord, I know it's disrespectful. I know it's against You. So Lord, I know I am a sinner. And now I look at You hanging on the cross dying for my sins. Shedding your blood. You died. And I believe you died. And I believe you were buried for three days. And I believe you arose on the third day like the Bible says. I believe you went to heaven and applied your blood to the very throne of Almighty God. I believe you came back uh, for about 40 days there as a witness and showed the disciples and everybody. Showed them your hands and, and spoke to them. And I believe in the book of Acts how that you arose and went up into the clouds. And the angel says, oh, why you men of Galilee stand here gazing? The same Jesus that went up before you will come back in like manner. Lord, please help somebody to ask you, save me, Lord. Save me right here, right now, and forever. And change me, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Then lead my life that it might bring glory and honor, not only to you, but also to myself and those I'm connected to. We love you. Hugs and kisses in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.